<laughs> Yay. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Jenny, for doing this with me. Um, hi, I'm Chris. So this is bad at keeping secrets. And today I have Jenny Odell. Um, that really sounded like a sports broadcaster. But anyway, <laughs> we are talking about saving time, which I'm going to hold up because I have it and I'm excited about it. Um, but Jenny and I met, I don't know, 15 years ago now. Uh, we went to grad school together. Yeah, that sounds, no, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. At SFAI, we met, I think, in 2008. But anyway, uh, it's sort of crazy to have known you this long. And I am so unbelievably proud to say that I know you. But um, today we're going to talk a little bit about your new book, Saving Time. Um, we talked a bit before about how to do nothing, but we never seemed to get the audio <laughs> and visual correct. <laughs> um, but now both of us uh, have proper headphones and phones. And I think I think this is going to go great today. But anyway, yeah. thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Uh, I think, um, so I kind of wanted to start out in the beginning, the intro of saving time, you talk about how this is not a practical book for making more time. And I feel like that's a really, I, I was wondering what you, um, meant by that, if you could elaborate on it. And also, because I think I interview a lot of people who are like in behavioral economics, who mm, are writing yeah. books for saving time or making yeah. more time. And I think in contrast to that, uh, your view of time will be really interesting yeah um yeah I guess I think my book is sort of like situated at the point where like you as an individual might run into like some limits in terms of like what you can do for yourself like I'm totally sympathetic to the desire for to both both to read and to write self-help right like we have we all have problems in our lives that you know um it'd be really nice to not only solve, but to like, feel like you're in control of, um, like I love Marie Kondo, you know, <laughs> like I read Marie Kondo's book and it did change my life. Like my, you know, like it, it helped me, um, and in a genuine way. But if you think about something like time, there's a lot of, I, I, I did read a lot of like time saving self-help or advice for writing this book. And a lot of it kind of boils down to like, you know, make a grid, like log, log the amount of time that you're spending doing different things and then sort of like rearrange that or change that to be more efficient. And like, that's not necessarily bad advice, but, um, you, you, the person doing that will might run up against things like your job or your employer, or, um, maybe you're a working mom and like women are just sort of societally expected to do more than men. There's no like reason for that. It's just, a, a thing that exists outside of you right um and those things are typically not addressed in such books and wouldn't wouldn't they, they wouldn't wouldn't expect them to be but I just kind of felt like if you if you really like take that question of like why does everyone feel like they don't have enough time and how could they have more time and you really like pursue it past that point then you kind of have to talk about you know, more historical context in terms of like, why do we even think about time this way? Or why, why do women get expected to do more work or these kind of like larger contextual things. So like, that's kind of where my book comes in. It's like at the meeting point of those two things. So I, I do, it's not that I don't think the book's not useful, but I think I was trying to like, you know, distinguish it at the beginning from something that's going to give you like tips and tricks, you know, for getting more time in your life. <laughs> I think, I think that brings up a couple of different directions that I want to kind of take a pause on. And I think you talk about in the 16th century, sort of the development of our Western notions of the clock. Um, and I think for me, you have this, I think it's a line about thinking about how systems are developed in service of who's developing them. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about that origin story. Yeah. Yeah. That was really surprising for me. Just I mean, I think it's surprising for anyone who lives right now because you just, there's all these things about clock time that you take for granted. Um, but like the fact, like, I think we really think of like hours and minutes as being like what time is, um, like that is the structure of time. But um, when I was kind of going, I want I wanted to find the point in history where like the way time is measured kind of peeled away from like natural cues. So like for a long time, we've had to mark time forever. Like humans have had to mark time forever. Um, you have to do that to survive and to flourish. 
Um, but the systems of marking time were for most of human history, like pretty naturally embedded, right? Like, which we're still aware of, right? Like we still, there's seasons and there's times of the year that you can only do something in that time of the year. But I was looking for that moment where like we, you get the notion of like an hour that it's just an hour. And that's obviously related to, you know, later things like time zones and um, being able to standardize a bunch of clocks. But uh, yeah, it's it kind of, it seems to have started in monasteries um, who did, they didn't have the abstract hours yet, but they did have um, like, they're really into clock, like bells, the clocks as bells basically, and like timing things um like making everything very punctual and there were all there were like punishments for showing up late to things like there was this kind of fetishization of like yeah having everything be exactly on time um and I was also very surprised to find out that Cistercian monasteries were like the most productive enterprises in Europe um like they had like they would make a lot of stuff they hired labor they did all of these things that like sound kind of like proto-industrial so it kind of makes sense that they would be really into this kind of like timing um and then the I the that kind of like bell bell tower type technology like kind of got picked up by these towns that were like rapidly commercializing and needing to basically needing the concept of like a man hour in order to like buy labor time from people so it's just it's like I think it's very, uh, I think I went into it thinking that like clock time like came from capitalism, but it's like, it's really like it came out of something a little bit earlier than that. And then capitalism found it very useful, <laughs> like kind when of picked it up and ran with it. When you think about how that's in evolved to the present day in terms of like surveillance, can you talk about what that sort of how the bells have evolved? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's pretty crazy, right? Like that's such a long history but you know like there's that happened um and then you know this notion of like standard time took over and then you obviously have like factories and industrialism um and this like the assembly line right um and but that yeah that does continue all the way into the present into um like I was looking at screenshots from this software called staff cop which is just like an incredible name uh which is one of many programs that can be installed like remotely on a, a remote worker's laptop and yeah basically can uh you know it's it's both meant to measure productivity and also like police all possible actions it's like two sides of the same coin um so that's something that I think maybe I think there was more of that during the pandemic and also people became more aware of that kind of technology but there's also you know uh the the scanner gun in an Amazon warehouse um, is also it it both is telling you where to go and aware of where you are and a timer like it's you know it's timing you um, UPS drivers have all of these like sensors in their trucks that kind of can tell like what they're doing and how long it's taking them so like that notion of yeah like really minutely timed and surveilled work is like just very much still with us and sort of like proliferating I think the sort of, I think there was a bit in the book where you talk about, and this, this kind of intersects with the idea of women's notion of time or how time works differently for different um, races and class and genders. Uh, but I think when I think about um, it, before this book, I thought about how my time, what a privilege is, is to order something off of Amazon. But I didn't actually equivocate that with being an active participant in sort of a not I don't want to say slavery because I don't know how how people would feel about that. But definitely in buying something from like H and M, I'm sort of it's outsourced, but it's still participating in a system. Can you talk a little bit about a? I know there's kind of like two questions there about um, how time is different our understanding of other people's time dependent on sort of intersections of race and, and class and uh, also about, sorry, Jenny, this got way long. <laughs> it's just when you were talking, I was like, oh, I really want you to talk about Amazon and how after thinking about the more I think about it, the more I'm just like, 
oh, this cannot be, but Amazon is so ubiquitously used and yeah. I don't know how I would run my business without it. Yeah, I know. That's a really difficult thing. I mean, I do. Yeah. I mean, the notion there's something, there is something really upsetting about the notion of, of someone's time existing in order someone's one person's experience of time making someone else's experience of time possible I mean I think that's part of why um you know like the part the chapter that I have on leisure I um you know I wanted to make the point that there's something about uh and I think I, I especially want to make this because I think it's like a it's it's a risk with something like how to do nothing right like my first book that there's like this risk that one would like um value like slowness as an aesthetic but um but then actually in pursuing that whether that's through leisure or something else it actually requires other people to maybe speed up their you know like to work faster or not necessarily work faster like there's also the notion of just being your time being at someone else's disposal right like um Sarah Sharma who's a sociologist that I or sorry media theory theorist that I quote um she writes really um fascinatingly about how like you know like the example of like the cab driver who's waiting at the airport for the jet setting businessman right like it's not necessarily that he's like having to go fast all the time it's that he has to wait for a while and then he has to go fast and then he has to wait again and so there's like it's it's interesting to think about like yeah who is whose schedule is having to line up with whose not just on the job but just like socially and yeah, it is typically like um, women and people of color who are expected to, whose whose temporality is not privileged or they're more expected to kind of like line themselves up with other people's schedules. Um, you know, like you think about a, a typical like nuclear family, you know, like the, not only is the the mother expected to do a lot more, but she's also expected to kind of fit everything around the like economic work schedule of like the nine to five and the school schedule, right? Like you're just, you're, you kind of come last in that <laughs> hierarchy. Yeah. It's sort of baffling to me to think about like what, how the school schedule, why the school schedule does not align with the work day. Yeah. I don't do you know, know the know answer there, to that question? I don't. And I know that they're, I don't know if it's in California, but I know there have been experiments with moving, moving that, like starting school later, because it's also really bad for teenagers to wake up that early. Yeah. That's yeah. what I've read too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that reminds me, well, uh, let's actually talk about the Linda and the non-Lindas right mm -hmm. now, because I feel like I'm, I fit very neatly in one of those categories. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. So that's, um, there's a uh, sociologist, Hartmut Rosa, who writes a lot about, um, time and, and acceleration, like the notion, this kind of like notion that one needs to always be getting more to stay afloat, that just that is a kind of like a, an assumption, cultural assumption. But he has this um, hypothetical character that he makes up to explain something and he calls her Linda. And as I write in the book, like I was reading this description of her and just like feeling very, like I was identifying with it a lot. But so Linda, is a professor who is like just super overworked um, and he describes her like going through her day. She doesn't have enough time to answer her emails, doesn't have enough time for her colleagues, doesn't have enough time for her students, doesn't have enough time to work out, doesn't have enough time for her partner. And he, she just like, at the end of all this, she just feels like super guilty and like she's falling behind, right? And it's like, you read this and you're like, that is know, my life. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then he just like immediately goes on to be like, isn't this all her own fault? And I'm just, and I was like, I feel so attacked. No, um, but he basically contrasts her her situation with the situation of someone who works in, like, say, a hospital, like a nurse who works in a hospital, or somebody who works in like a restaurant, where like the the sense of like time pressure is not only very real, but it's externally imposed. Like it's um, it's it's some it's an ex external thing that you are struggling to keep up with. Whereas Linda's thing that she's struggling to keep up with is very internal. And he kind of like chalks that internal thing up to 
that kind of uh, sort of, yeah, very capitalist notion of like always needing to get more in order to stay ahead, like that that inhabits her mind and it's like kind of driving her to to never be able to rest. So it's like one in one situation, yeah, that thing is outside of you and the other situation it kind of like lives in your head. And then I, when I would describe that in the book, I also kind of added, like, I think that there's a gray area between those two. Like I was an adjunct lecturer for a long time. You and I both probably know a lot of adjuncts and that's an example. Or we also know a lot of people who work for themselves. Um, you work for yourself, you know? Um, and I think that's a gray area where yet yeah, it is true that you control in a way your own time, like your schedule, like you're not, you're not being given a work schedule by someone else. Um, and you might be working mostly alone, but it's also true that for example, an adjunct, if let's say an adjunct arts professor, they don't produce enough work or look, per, appear to be culturally productive, they may not get hired the next you know semester or whatever, or their class might not get enough enrollment. So now they're just not going to get paid. So I do think that there's like a pretty big gray area between the like the Lindas and the non-Lindas. And I also think that the same person can go from one situation to another in one lifetime. Like, I don't think it's like a hard category, but I did find that useful in terms of thinking like about time, the feeling of time pressure and that there is, there is a difference between someone who really does not have control over their time. Like someone who works like two jobs and has children and is like a single mom or something. And then someone who just feels really, really feels like they don't have any time, you know, like that's uh, and that they but that they do share something in common, which is that kind of like very capitalist notion of always needing to, you know, get more profit more. It's just that in one case, you're like the person working for the person trying to get more profit. And then the second situation, you're just trying to do it to yourself. I think that in addition to the or to add to the gray area for me. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of our collective interdependent, because I feel like the the Linda, the first Linda, um, <laughs> has like, there's also this idea embedded that she has autonomy in a way yeah. that she can make her own choices and that she is an individual. And to an extent, I, I think that that's true, but also I don't, I don't know if there's a way I think since I don't necessarily believe, and I don't know how you feel about this, and maybe it's obvious that we have free will to like, I think that the, like we're exploring right now, my theory is that we are exploring these sort of cultural undercurrents in our conscious minds, like between the two of us, but they're already sort of like embedded in our subconscious and they're shared like, again this may sound I feel like this sounds like really Nazi but <laughs> I I don't know if I don't know if I think Lunda is necessarily I don't know where the onus is I guess in this situation like is the yeah, onus yeah. on Linda or yeah. society or where I mean theoretically with awareness Linda could the first Linda could make alterations and potentially help other non-Lindas I don't know yeah, I, I was wondering no, if you I could speak you mean, to this yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think in like, so the the guy, so Rosa, who like wrote about this, like, I think his description of it is pretty, like, he's like, she, her, her unconscious is like, is inhabited by, I forget what he calls it, it's like the, the logic of expansion or something that's like Ooh. driving her. So like, I think he would agree with your characterization, right? Like, um, that... And I think that there's, I don't know, I personally my like the way that I feel about free will and about like individual agency versus like structure is like, I feel like it's a false binary. That's just like where, where I am now in terms of thinking about it. So I think, I think you can have both, right? Like, I think it can be true that her, that she is un, uh, inhabited by the logic of expansion and that she is a capable, um, maybe not all the time, but in some moments of like being able to reflect on that or like see it. Cause I mean, like I've had the, I think like most people have had the experience of like doing something or believing something unconsciously and then you had it pointed out to you and then you didn't feel the same way about it anymore. Even if it still drove you sometimes, like it won't be the same, like after you have pointed it out. And I think that's what's valuable about like his work and sort of like describing that is that I think 
you know, people might read that description and sort of like see themselves and then like kind of understand more like, why do I, why am I always like, as he puts it, like jumping over your own shadow? Yeah, I don't know. I think, I think about this a lot because I, again, I want to believe that they both can coexist, but I'm not, I don't know why I'm, I'm not so convinced. I think it's also because I don't really understand the biology behind what's going on in and how like consciousness is composed in physics yeah yeah Um, I mean I think it's like a very it's it's a difficult question for like a really good reason and actually just find it really fascinating I do too while 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 frustrating yeah (laughs) (laughs) absolutely wait I want to go back to the introduction of the book when you talk about uh the ancient Greek notion of chronos and kairos is it Mm -hmm. yeah um and maybe describe those and as a way of thinking to help us sort of uh enter into saving time yeah so chronos um is kind of like you know you see it in the word chronology um of the two of those it's kind of the one that's more concerned with like linear time both i i associate it both with kind of like everyday time you know like just time uh that is marching onwards, let's say, and then also like historical, like a historical timeline that's kind of going forward in this linear way um, versus Kairos, which is like a time of interruption. And like when you, when people say like seize the time, like that's the kind of time that I associate with Kairos. It's like, it's, it's thought of as like being uh, a time in which like something, like a lot happens, like a lot changes and it's like very active. Um, And a lot of people who have, have written, I mean, people especially who write about climate have found it really useful because I think there's the Kronos version of time really lends itself to like despair. Um, you know, like like I see that things are getting worse. They're going to continue to get worse. Um, and like the future is sort of a foregone conclusion versus Kairos, which is like, this is a moment of both like great danger and great opportunity. And like one must be really present and and know that like a lot can change very quickly. So yeah, I mean, let's uh, like when I think about Kairos, like I, I often think about the, the book by Rebecca Solnit, Paradise Built in Hell, which is like one of my favorite books. Um, because she's, you know, she's researching people's reactions in the immediate aftermath of both man-made and natural disasters. And like the way that, and interviewing people and the way that they talk about that time, they'll, that sounds a lot like Kairos. Like they'll say like, yeah, it was this really sort of horrifying time, but at the same time, like I met my neighbors and I had a sense of purpose. And like, we all stepped up in these ways that like none of us expected, like, like something new happened like in this space. And then, you know, things kind of go back to normal and kind of like collapse back into Kronos. And like some of those people that she interviews sound nostalgic, even though it was like this disaster, right? But it's like, it was this time that felt very active. So that's kind of like how I see the distinction between those two. And obviously, yeah, one really goes hand in hand with despair and the other one is like, you know, maybe not hope (laughs) exactly, but it does um, make the future look like something that you should or can respond to versus something that's going to like happen to you. I think the trickiness with sort of um, grappling, sorry, I recently interviewed um, a woman on, have you read The Sunny Nihilist? No. Uh, It's really good. Or I mean, I loved it. Uh, But talking about thinking about nihilism and climate change, like why we should care, because this is the one thing that we could potentially actually change even though like we live in like an ultimate, like a, a universe that doesn't care if like humanity lives or dies, um, we could still affect change in the future um, with, with regards to the climate and create meaning. And I was wondering like throughout Saving Time, you talk about a meaningful life. Um, and I was kind of thinking maybe you could talk about making meaning and and time and There's another thing you do where you, and again, it probably annoys you that people are like, you say this, you say that, and it's not exactly right. (laughs) But um, you're, I think one of your fears is you spending, wasting your life or wasting your time in pursuit of things that 
I don't know, don't matter. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, my, <clears throat> my lingering cold. Um, so yeah, I think, um, the, the meaning part of it, I mean, I talk about that a lot at the end of the book and I sort of, after I've established kind of like the fact that that sort of acknowledging something the, the aliveness of something outside of yourself means like seeing it in time like uh you know like uh for example if you like I started bird watching you know I don't know how many years ago six or seven years ago um and I feel like since then I've because I live in the same neighborhood and I've seen the same birds, um, I'm much more aware of them in time, which means that like both on the small scale and the large scale, like I, in the, in the moment, it's like, I see them. Whereas like before you might, I might've just seen them as like, oh, they're just there. Like now I, I'm like, oh, they're like responding to that. They, they saw a hawk. So they're like freaking out or like they're building their nest or they're, just chasing each other around whatever they're like doing something right and then also over the course of the year it's like oh these they're singing a different in a different way right now because it's spring or you know so it's it and there's like a the role of time in that sort of situation is that like that makes that makes their experience like more real to me like they don't seem like they're just yeah like I don't know inert beings that are just kind of there and uh and I think the same goes for people right like there is a way of looking at other people that where that doesn't really afford them like a timeline like they're just uh you know like NPCs you know like that's what people would say like in a video game like they're just kind of there um and so what that has to do with meaning for me is like for me a meaningful life is like a life of encounter with other humans and non-humans that are also alive and are like as alive as I am um and I want to like feel that in the encounter that it's like a, an encounter between equally alive like entities right um which requires me to be able to understand that that that, that person or thing or whatever um has its own experience like it has its own um future and its own past and like I one of the things that I was like the most floored by that I you know that I put in the book was that study about um the lesser minds bias, which is like the bias that you have that um, towards, especially people in like a, a social group that you don't identify with um, as having like a less complex inner life. Um, and the experiment that they did was they had the, the participants imagine a typically dehumanized group. So like homeless people and drug addicts and think about them and the their brain scans didn't show like the parts of your mind that are associated with like empathy or like theory of mind lighting up and then they asked them to imagine if that person would like a certain vegetable like just not even just imagine like would they like uh, this vegetable or not and those areas started lighting up which is just like incredible because it just all that did was like acknowledge that that person has preferences and if you have preferences that means that you have a past like and you have a there are things that you experience in the past and there are things that you want in the future. So, um, so I guess like, cause when I think about like a meaningless life, like I imagine like, you know, being a workaholic, not just being a workaholic, but being a workaholic who lives in a world that doesn't speak back to them. Like where like nothing else is alive except for like you um, versus like to me, a meaningful life is one where like everything is speaking to you all the time. And like you are with you are you are like in the world and like with the world. Uh, can we talk about rocks? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and how this applies to rocks? Potentially. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> that was another one of my favorite um, things that I referenced in the book was there's a, a book by uh, an indigenous writer, George Tinker, about why rocks are alive. And it's just like an amazing, amazing paper. And it's just, it's, it's very thoughtfully laid out. And one of the things he says is like, it seems really arrogant to him that we, d that we don't even know what consciousness is. And yet um, we're so sure about who has it and who doesn't. 
Um, but yeah, he that that paper and a couple of other things that I um, cited, you know, like non-Western sources, like they have a very different notion of what it means to be alive. Um, like, you know, for, for us, like right now, traditionally, it's like something that, you know, like acts and moves through the world and reproduces and um, and all that. But this other model is like something is a, alive to the degree that it like basically participates in the world, like it affects other things. Um, and uh, I don't, something that I think about a lot is like, if you go, really like go to the, go to the boundary of something that you would consider alive and not alive, like let's say like a tree and a rock, that it's the rocks of the soil or something. And you really like go all the way to the interface. It's actually very porous, right? It's almost like hard to make a distinction. Like the minerals are being taken in by the tree, and um, and also like thinking about time scale and how like act geologically active an area can be. Like um, I'm someone who has spent a lot of time in the Santa Cruz Mountains and like has just thought a lot about how they were made. <laughs> you know, like why are they there and like how like why are there these shapes here and it's still very active especially with all the storms it's like eroding um and so I think I don't know I'm on board with the idea that rocks are alive um and obviously not everyone is but it it is I did think it was interesting I was just in Australia for book tour stuff and Australia and New Zealand and I, I don't know if it was just me or the people that I talked to but it seemed to me like the readers there were way more open to the idea that rocks are alive and I was like, is it just because they spend more time around rocks? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, maybe that's just like familiarity with something. Like, What's the argument like, against it? That rocks aren't alive? I mean, it's yeah. like, a, it's just, I mean, it's not really an argument. It's like, it's it's which view of aliveness you subscribe to, right? It's like, mm -hmm. like the the other paper that I, that I mentioned in that part of the book is where they're interviewing indigenous Mexican children about whether or not the ground is alive. And it's just kind of depends on like, like some of them have like adopted the, the view that they're probably being taught in school, which is like the biological, like definition of being alive. And then the other ones are just using like a different model of what, what aliveness means. And it just depends on which one you adopt, right? Like, I mean, yeah. I guess also that when I think about the complexities that arise when one thinks, when considers, um, the aliveness or like the expansion of aliveness to things that I grew up being told were not alive, like a rock. Um, it, it really complicates things in the sense of also feeling a deep empathy in weird ways to maybe inanimate objects, which also seems really fun and interesting, but possibly also, I just wouldn't know. I don't know where to stop. I'm totally on board with, um, I thinking it's, I don't know, thinking it's potentially, I don't think humans are special as yeah, special as maybe either. we think yeah. uh, at a dinner party. Um, the other day I met this woman who said like the only thing that's going to shake humanity of our feeling of specialness or uniqueness is finding life, similar life on another planet. And she was like, it needs to happen in the next 10 years for us to combat. That was her solution to like oh. having humans act on climate change, that and having India fall underwater or become a series of islands. And I was like, oh, I, I really hope we can figure this out prior to yeah. both of those having to happen. It's also just like, I don't know. I, I really love um, that book by Ed Yong um, yeah. about animal senses. And I just... I really feel like, I mean, we don't, you don't need to go to outer space <laughs> to find like really, I don't know, like, ama like amazing forms of intelligence that are so different from ours. Like, it's just look any, I don't know, just like look anywhere else, especially in like the deep sea, because that's just like really unexpected to us, like the way things look. But I don't, I don't know. I don't think you need to go to outer space. I think we, can we talk a little bit your mo about your moss invasion? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't actually know when that happened, but at some point a moss spore must've come through my window because a moss started growing in this planter in my windowsill. And it's the beginning of the book because I wanted to start with this image of, 
I want to just, yeah, I wanted to start with a description of a moment where like a spore came in and like populated something because that's kind of like the, it's a natural beginning. And it's also kind of like the way the book like unfolded for me was like, you have this kind of small question and then it like turns into something um, that, that has its own life. But uh, but yeah, it meant that there was this little moss that was growing and uh, I happened to have read Robin Wall Kimmerer's book about moss. So I, I knew like a little bit more about moss than I would have before and had more appreciation for it as like a, a something that's like responding to the environment in real time in terms of like moisture. Um, but it was also kind of funny because, you know, from the point of view of the moss, it's, you know, to me, it feels like the moss came into my apartment, right? But it's like the moss doesn't recognize that boundary <laughs> between right like like I don't know I think as like humans you think of like you're like this is my habitation and then like the outside world is like outside of it and in fact you're always trying to keep it out in terms of like insects and like other like marks of the outside world um and so it kind of like was this it like troubled the boundary between like my living space and like what is outside especially because the moss the that it probably came from is like right outside like on the steps so I've seen it um but yeah it was just I I the other reason that I start the book with that is because moss what I had learned about it from from Robin Wall Kimmerer's book is that it really also complicates ideas about time like the fact that a moss can go dormant for decades without water and then come back baffling yeah like that really is you know that's very (laughs) non-linear um and then the fact that it doesn't have doesn't have have a vascular system, so like when so it doesn't have you know what I mean like it doesn't have like those um, channels that would like um, bring water through like a plant. Um, it's just absorbing moisture directly from the air. Like Robin Walkimer, um compares it to like the parts of your lungs that are absorbing things. Um, so it also is just kind of like a a real time like indicator of like what's happening around it. It's very hard to separate it from its surroundings. So and there's just all these ways in which like, I think, cause I was just looking at it a lot. It's just kind of, yeah, it complicates some things that you take for granted about what like an entity is. And then also like what a, a lifetime is like a moss spore is kind of both alive and not alive at the same time. Um, and I think those, you know, because it's not, it could just be a spore for a while until it turns into this actual like living moss plant. So do you think that there's a, I, I was kind of thinking, I know we only have a few more minutes left because I feel like um, I have so many questions for you and I, I want to actually, I'm going to go and ask you if you would talk about beans. Um, Sorry, I'm like asking <laughs> yeah. you the questions that I'm asking you that make sense are like one word, beans, moss, yeah. crops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no but that's actually very related to the spore thing because um okay so the beans part of the book um is based on a conversation that I had with my friend who's in her 70s who was planting these beans in her garden while I was talking to her um and they were descended from beans 20 years earlier that she had gotten from a place that she doesn't remember and they were like these very delicious beans that she gave to her friends and then uh, they grew some of them to seed and gave them back to her because she didn't know where to get them anymore. Um, and so there's been this like ongoing exchange between her and those friends and then friends beyond them. So she thinks that maybe these beans exist like all the way across the country at this point. Um, and she, I was working on the book at that time. So we were talking about it and kind of thinking about the fact that a bean contains the past and the future. Um, and that it too can sort of sit for a surprisingly long time, you know, not forever, but um, before it's grown again. Uh, and I don't know, I, I think it was like a really, it was a really beautiful illustration, not just of that kind of like past and future being in in one thing and the pop, the, like the dormancy, but also this non-transactional exchange that had been going on with her and her friends where, um, that's the thing also the seeds, beans right? like, yeah like if I give you like I it's like it's something where I can give you some and then we can both have more instead of like I give you some so I have less you know um and so that's why yeah she and I were talking about like yeah if time isn't money then maybe time is beans because um 
because it, there's something about that there's something about them that acknowledges that that uh I don't know you can think of like times in your life where like something seemingly small happened or someone did something seemingly very small for you and then it just cascaded into a bunch of other circumstances that like completely changed your entire life um and or it and it maybe didn't happen for a long time you know like someone gives you a book you don't read it for 10 years and then you finally read it and then it like changes everything right like and then maybe like or I've also had experiences where people have come to like book signings and they and they had read how to do nothing and they made something based on it and they're giving it to me now like there's that, you know what I mean? And it's not like we both have more now. It's not like one of us has less. So I just think that that's, um, there's so much about modern life that feels transactional and like very zero sum game and competitive. And I think that, that, that the beans were a very important model for me of like something different. I think this makes me think about, I, I feel like I live the most waking moments in this sort of scarcity complex kind of, I think that that's also reflective of Linda as we were talking about and thinking about the beans and sort of what would a cooperative, what would a, what would a life look like if there was enough? Cause I do believe that there is enough to sustain all of us um, yeah. if we cared to view it that way, but somehow I still, I mean, that's something that I really struggle with most days. And especially now, like with the uncertainty of the future. And I think a lot about this, like an argument for universal basic income. Like, yeah. I feel like even just knowing that everybody would be taken care of would allow a certain amount of letting go of worrying yeah. about having to sort of get as much as you have because someone yeah. else is going to look out for you if you were to fall. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it would also, um, it would enable these other kinds of exchanges to happen more, right? Like, I think there are, I think we, we want that, right? Like, we want to be able to have those exchanges, but they do require like a base level of security. Yeah, that reminds me of, there is a moment, I think, where you talk, you're in the grocery store and time sort of, uh, time becomes both vertical and horizontal. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And could you, could you talk, define, I know that we're really close to being out of time, but could you really briefly talk about <laughs> vertical and horizontal yeah. time? Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, so that's like an idea from this book called Leisure, the Basis of Culture by Joseph Pieper, who was a German Catholic philosopher. Um, and he, uh, he makes an argument in that book that leisure should not exist for the sake of work, which really resonated with me. Um, because there's like a notion of leisure that like it just kind of like you're fixing up the work machine right like you're just sort of making it so you can like run more smoothly or just recover um and that's obviously very important but that but he's sort of like you know that's not true leisure um and so both of those kinds of things like work and refreshment for more work he would put on the horizontal plane of time and then for him the vertical plane of time is like the moment when like I'm trying to think of an example like uh you see like this would happen to me a lot when I was at Stanford I'd be like rushing to class and I'm like running out of time and I'm just like thinking about all the things I didn't do and then I would see some like really unexpected migratory bird in a tree and for a moment like I would completely forget about everything I might even forget like who I am and just like have this ex like this experience of just like total awe and like the, of like the strangeness and the beauty of it and the fact that you're like even seeing it at all and that you're alive like that whole kind of complex of thoughts that then very quickly collapses back into I'm like I have to get to I'm class like horizontal time again um so uh but yeah I think like any any of these kinds of moments of like being being like extremely highly aware and like grateful that like you're alive or just being very open to even like in a sensory way, just being like really open to what's actually happening in front of you. That's like a vertical time kind of experience. Um, and yeah, I mentioned that during the pandemic, I was, I, I would sometimes have surprising moments of like vertical time in part because there was, I mean, there was so much that was awful about the pandemic, but it was also really defamiliarizing. So that moment happened for me when I was waiting in line, one of those spaced out lines, right? Like in front of the grocery store that I go to all the time, 
because it meant that I was standing in like a relation to the building in a way that I never would have before, you know? And it was just suddenly, it just kind of like, I don't know, it like uh, dislodged it from like my, my familiarity. And I was like looking at the other people in the line and thinking about like what a weird moment in history this was and just like feeling a lot of like, I don't know, like affection for other people in the line that we're all just like here trying to get our groceries and like no one knows what's going to happen. And versus like, I feel like a horizontal time experience of that would have been like, these people are in my way. Like there's, yeah. oh, there's all these people in line. Like I just need to get inside and get my groceries. Is there something about, can you talk about how or what it is about? And perhaps this is incorrect to think about like these collecting these moments where one feels small or like, um, feeling the smallness of the universe in relation to your life. Cause I think there's, there's something, there's an enmeshment there for me with those two ideas. Yeah. Vertical time and. Oh it's, yeah. This. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's kind of, um, I have that like quote at the end of that chapter from the, this like abolitionist activist that I was interviewing about about this kind of experience and she kind of like describes that like she's like describing like a hike in Puerto Rico but like where like she's so aware of all of these like the history of like colonization there and like all like she's just you know there's a lot um there's a lot of heavy stuff but then even in the midst of that she just kind of has this moment where like she feels really small like and it's just like the the like the bird song and like everything and like the friends that she's with like everything kind of like envelops her um and it is also a very fleeting moment I think for her but um yeah I think there's and that feels so different I think from so like to me that's the polar opposite feeling to um the way that I feel for example when I'm overworked um <laughs> uh, or I'm overworking myself um which is very isolating, right? You typically in that moment feel very isolated. I often feel like I'm the only, I, it's just me and the clock and like my problem that I'm trying to solve. And like, no, one oh, is 100%. Entering, like no one is entering that. The time of day is like irrelevant. Like the, I'm very like disconnected from everything. Um, and I feel almost like too big, like in that moment, like I am like, it's just all like very close versus this other feeling which is like I am a, I am like a little speck that is like embedded in this like uh, like really incredible and like complex thing that like I I can't control but that there's like a relief in like giving up that sense of like trying to control I was gonna that was the exact word I was gonna use the feeling of yeah. relief that your your worries are the sort of like feeling unsurmountable amount of stress on your body just letting go of the meaning is, is really comforting at times. And it feels really good. I think um, relief is my favorite sort of complex web of emotions I like to sit in. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like when some people strive to be happy, I, I really, I really <laughs> enjoy feeling a sense of relief um, yeah. and whatever that means to you. I kind of wanted to end with since, since we're way over time uh, and I can't remember where exactly this is, but um, and cor correct me if I'm wrong on this quote, but maybe the point isn't to live more in the literal sense or have a more productive life, but what is the point? Or could you kind of uh, sum up that? Yeah. That? <clears throat> yeah. I, um, yeah, I, I think, I think I go on to say like the point is to like feel more alive in any given moment. So I guess it's basically like to, to try to live closer to that sense of like vertical time obviously that's impossible like you like there are things you have to do in life and also you know acknowledging that like you your your position in terms of like structures of power and and like how empowered or disempowered you are but um I do think that there is often some leeway in terms of like choosing to the to the degree that you're able to choose um to be open to encounters with things that are things and people and places that are that will change you um I don't know I guess like again like thinking about like the the what I think of as like meaning a meaningless experience of life um 
and which very much goes with wanting to control things, right? And control your experience. I think um, I think that's the same mindset that would want to kind of like almost like plan out your whole life, um, you know, like or plan out and like maximize the value of your whole life, um, which doesn't sort of let anything in, <laughs> like like things that are things that are beyond you or things that will surprise you or um, and being open to the idea that like you will be changed. Um, like you will become a person that you don't, that you cannot currently predict. And like that to me is like an exciting thing. Like it's something to be lived for. Um, so yeah, I guess there's, because that, that does, I mean, I feel like that does have to do with the experience of time, right? It's like, if you think about days that felt long in a good way, <laughs> like there's days I feel long in a bad way but like days where you feel like you experienced so much like it's for me typically those are days where I was like encountering something either that was new or I was encountering it in a new way um and then the days that feel the most compressed are the ones where I just kind of like sleepwalked through them because I thought I knew what everything was and I was like had a one-track mind and was like had like a kind of like an impatient attitude towards everything and everyone no, totally. I think, uh, sorry to ask you again what the, what the point of everything is. It's so, so complicated and convoluted, but I also think you have a lot of really interesting vantage points and frameworks to think about these questions in, in alongside of time and how we're spending it. I think part of the whole thing is like, we've been taught also that there has to be a point and that also, yeah. um, to, 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 somehow there's this is embedded with maximizing time the having a point and so I understand the sort of ridiculousness of that question but at the same time I'm like longing to know it um or find it or seek it out um and I definitely think this saving time will change how I encounter um and exist and I think as a person I would say in my practice relationships are endlessly fascinating and I feel like relationships is synonymous with encounters in a lot of yeah, ways totally um thank you so much Jenny for doing this with me I really appreciate it I might force you to swim with me sometime even though you've oh, said I no got a, a new bathing suit, so I'm like ready yeah <laughs> okay I need, um, yeah um, I will text you okay <laughs> okay yeah bye thank you okay. so much yeah thank you bye hey Jenny